Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Trondosius. I'm one of four authors of this paper on authoring spatial music with SPATDIF version 0.4. And um, <clears throat> SPATDIF, I also should say that Chikashi, one of the other authors, is also here and will be presenting later in this session. Um, the SPATDIF is the spatial sound description interchange format. And this is, a, this is an in initiative to get um, a specification for describing uh, spatial audio. Uh, it's a semantic and it's a syntactic specification um, in order to store and transmit spatial audio scene descriptions. And we aim for this to be simple and minimal, but also extensible. And um, it's in, and industry independent, it's lightweight and it's human readable. And the human readability of it is a, is a very important factor of it because we're very much aiming this towards composers that are working with creating spatial audio content. Um, it's also a specification that is implementation agnostic. So it's not geared towards any particular platform or programming language or file format. Uh, and currently, we have examples that we provide in, in a variety of form, formats, such as uh, XML, uh, JSON, and um, OSC. And the purpose of this, uh, of this specification is to encourage portability and exchange, because I think a lot of, uh, a lot of spatial audio content is tied to the tools that are used to create it and to the venue that is produced for. Uh, so we want to you know, have this format encourage portability between venues and between different sound, surround sound infrastructures that are used to create and reproduce spatial audio. Um, and this paper has, or, or this partif is, has been kind of in the making for, 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 for several years now. And we had a paper in the or article in Computer Music Journal a few years ago that is presenting uh, a lot of the ideas of the previous version of it that was 0.3. So I'm going to talk today mostly about what's new in the 0.4 specification. And, uh, but before I do that, I just need to lay out a few of the concepts that, that we are using a lot in the specification and, and, and in, in the thinking of it. And the first of it is that we are thinking of the process of working with spatial audio as a stratified, as a layered model. Um, and, and this we described in the paper at the SMC conference in 2009 where we were suggesting thinking of this in terms of six different layers. And starting from the bottom, we have the physical devices, um, which is speakers, amplifiers, you know, everything physical that you need to deal with. And the next layer is the hardware abstraction layer, where your computer system is interacting with this. So things like core audio, drivers for sound card, things like that. Next comes the two layers that are actually deciding what sound is going to go to which speaker that is distributing the sound to the speaker by encoding, encoding and then decoding. And for some specialization techniques, this takes place in one and the same process. Vector-based uh, vector -based, uh, amplitude panning would be one example of it. While in ambisonics, there's an encoding into B format first and then a decoding afterwards. Then on the fifth layer comes the scene description layer. And the purpose of this layer is to describe the audio, audio scene, describe the content of it, the way it's observed, the way it's thought when it's composed, and the way it's observed when listened to. And the sixth layer on top of this again is the scene authoring layer. And this is a layer for where you would be thinking of processes that are driving the scene. So if you want, an object in the scene to move from one place to another according to a certain function of, you know, or something like that. That describing that function would be something that would be happening on the sixth layer, while the description of where it is at any one time would be at the fifth layer. So the fifth layer is descriptional, while the sixth layer also deal with intentions and the mechanisms of the processes involved. And SPATDEF has been, we've implemented SPATDEF as a library, this is Shikashi that has been doing that, that is available for various host environments. And this is accessible and being used in uh, open frameworks applications as external for Macs and for PD. 
And uh, Shikash will later on show how this has been used in a zirconium uh, application that's developed at Satkayam. And, and the last sort of um, fundamental idea to present before I start discussing about the new features is also that we're thinking of uh, the SPATDEF specification as consisting of a core which is very slim and lean. It's only working at the fifth layer. It's, it's a purely descriptive thing, and this is sort of like the minimum thing required in order to be able to reproduce spatial audio scenes. And then we have a number of extensions that would, for instance, give additional uh, information on how the rendering is intended to happen, or um, like the scene authoring information. And any application that is uh, SPATDEF compatible, you know, should at least support the core and then they might choose to uh, also support more of their, of their specification. And if, if an application receives material that is using extensions that this application is not using, then the idea is that they should fail gracefully, you know, with, the, with respect to the, specific, uh, the part of the specification in the, in the score that they don't know how to deal with. Uh, so that there's like a fallback to something that is as close to the intention as this application is able to deliver. So in version three, uh, we were describing like the core functionalities which are here on the scene description uh, layer and also a number of uh, extensions for encoding, decoding and, and at the hardware uh, abstraction layer, layer. And the specification number 04 is mostly intended to expand this on the sixth layer, the authoring layer. So we're introducing a new tra trajectory extension for describing trajectories. And this is the most important addition that is done in, in 0.4. There's also a group extension being introduced. And the trajectory extension, which I will discuss in detail now, um, depends on the number of other extensions that we have also been adding. But they are not they are necessarily only available or can only be used at the sixth layers. So we're thinking of these extensions as being accessible also elsewhere by other processes that are using their SPATIF. So interpolation, we're extending you know, the ways you can interpolate and we are extending the, with you know, extension for points at geometry, automation and shape. And finally, there's also an extension of the fifth layer with respect to describing like the source spread. So what I'll do now is to start talking about mostly the, the trajectory extension and then also uh, look into the other ones along the way. So the trajectory extension is the most important one. And the trajectory is defined by a point set um, or it could be by a shape template, which is describing, you know, like, like the spatial uh, shape of the trajectory. This shape can then also be mani manipulated by means of geometric uh, transforms. It depends on the spatial interpolation and in addition you need to also describe how you are traversing this trajectory. So that's an automation profile that is also added. So all of these extensions relate to the ability to describe trajectories. In addition to this, we're also extending with the ability to describe groups and uh, source spread. So if we start out with looking at point sets, the idea here is that this is a bundle of points that we can use to describe trajectories. And here's like one example of a number of points. And as this, uh, this illustration reveals, this also uh, we are also using uh, cubic Bessier splines for interpolation. So that means that in this point set that there might be two different kind of points. It's the anchor points, the points that are actually on the curve, and then the handle points that are used to describe the curvature uh, when interpolating. So the interpolation extension which existed from beforehand, you were able to interpolate, you know, do simple interpolations on the fifth layer already with the linear interpolations, but now we're extending this with cubic uh, Bezier splines. And um, when it comes to the automation, um, this is a separate curve that is also described. 
And the idea here is that if you look at the trajectory, you could think of this as a pathway, you know, that can be, you can wander along this pathway in one way or another. But automation is describing how you're traversing this uh, pathway. And we're using, uh, we're able to use Bezier functions for this as well. So, um, so the automation curve will be in the range from zero to one, where zero is at the start of the trajectory and one will be at the end of the trajectory. So for instance, if you're using this automation time curve that you see here, it means that you start here, you start by walking slowly, then you speed up, and then you slow down in the end. While the other curve here would mean that you, you start slowly, but you speed up a lot, and you get actually all the way to the end, and then you start going back, stop for a while, take a look before you go all the way back home. So this is the example of you know, how you're splitting, splitting the, like, like the, these functions in time into two curves, one that is purely spatial and one that is purely time-based. And one could ask why we are choosing this approach rather than using math functions where x, y, z is a function of t. Um, but one of the things that we've been concerned here with is that you know, we want to be able to facilitate as many functions as possible with as lean a set of features as possible. And we think that this is, is a solution that is getting us very far in that respect. Um, we know that, you know, like PostScript, for instance, that is used for any kind of um, uh, graphical printing um, or vector-based printing, you know, using spline functions, and we, and we see how much, you know, you can do with that. So we think that this is providing us with a lot of very rich possibilities for describing curves, while if we were using functions, you know, we would easily end up in a situation where we would have to extend with more and more and more and more mathematical functions, you know, for any kind of trajectory that you could imagine. So we think that this is a more efficient way, a leaner way of doing this. <clears throat> it's also, I think, when you're composing, probably the shapes, the, the shape of the trajectory, you know, can often be thought of as a compositional material and as a kind of spatial motifs. So you want, may want to reuse your shapes. And for this reason, we are providing some basic primitives that you can use, uh, which are illustrated here. In, and these are described in a shape extension. And the shape extension is really sort of a set of macros for trajectories, you know, like, like pre-made templates for, for shapes. And we're providing the point, the line, triangle, re rectangle, circle, and arc. But then in addition to, that, to this, uh, when you are authoring your own spatial scene, you can, you can describe your own uh, trajectories and you can use these as, uh, as uh, templates in the same way and then reuse them later on. And this becomes you know, even more flexible when you're also able to do different kind of uh, affine geometric uh, transforms on these shapes that you're working with. So we also have an extension that you know, describes how to do scales, translations, which is moving the trajectory in space, uh, rotations, mirroring, and skewing of it. So this is a way of kind of like you now making these shapes into a very flexible uh, material. And looking back at the layered model, um, a spatial scene that is described using SPATIF always needs to have the scene description on the fifth layer, which can be thought of as a rasterized expression. You know, it's like 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 frames in time of where the different sources are at any one time. And if you have that and you also do the authoring so that you're using these trajectories, then you will be, for all practical reasons, describing the same movement twice in your script. But this is something that, uh, that we require. And the reason for this is that the, the fifth layer rasterized uh, representation, that is like the fallback version that can, be, uh, that can be played back by any uh, renderer that is able to deal with the SPATIF core. So three minutes, that's fine. Um, while, while, this, while the trajectory, uh, the vectorized uh, description, you know, on the sixth layer will only be, you know, 
it will express something about the intention, the compositional intention of the processes involved here. And if you're using software that's able to work with it, then this can you know, form the basis for different, for instance, graphical user interface ways of you know, interacting with and authoring and changing uh, these trajectories. But it's important that the fifth layer description is always also present because this, uh, this is a for fallback for it. So the last two extensions to talk about, uh, which are sort of um, not part of the trajectory part thing, one of them is the ability to group uh, ent entities. So this could be used for grouping sources like speakers, but probably most of the time we're interested in grouping several sound sources, you know, like, like sources in the scene, so that you can move them together. And once you've done this, you can, form, you, you can perform the same kind of transforms that you could do with the trajectories. Um, but of course, here there might be ambiguity if you have a source that is part of a group and you describe, for instance, a trajectory of a group, and then you also at the same time attempt to describe a trajectory for one of these sources itself. And in this case, the trajectory of the group will be overriding the individual one. So if a source becomes part of a group, it's controlled by the movements of the group uh, and, not, and can't be accessed individually. And if you want to access it individually, you will have to do what is illustrated below here, that you will need to decouple it from the group, do the movement that they want to do, and then you can you know, add it to the group again. So these groups are flexible. You know, things can be added and removed from them you know, at, as, as you need throughout. And then finally, um, the last extension, which is for describing uh, sources that has a certain uh, spatial extent. There's lots of uh, rendering, uh, rendering that have different ways of uh, describing this. And we wanted to add like a minimum uh, general way of describing this, which is just like a, as a percentage. And this is something that you find, for instance, in VBAP. You find it in the distance-based amplitude panning algorithm. Um, in ambisonics, you can work with this by by reducing the or yeah reducing the directedness of the signals and so on. So this is like a minimal way of describing this that might be used in different renderings. And I think that's the end of it. Thank you, Claude. Mm -hmm.